My name is Glenn Silverman. I would be familiar to many, but to those who don't know me, I've been in the asset management industry for well over 30 years. I joined Rescura in a full-time capacity, 1st of July this year, and my key role is that of investment strategist. So we've been involved in this very exciting project, which uh, we're going to, and report and, and others we're going to present to you today, which we entitled Moving the Needle. So I want to just chat, tell you about what today we intend to cover. So I want to talk about the study itself. I want to talk about what we hope to achieve. And then through the interviews and the, the work that we did, some very important concepts that I think set the groundwork and the, the frame, the perspective from which one has a look at this entire study. I'm going to cover half of the key findings and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Chad, who will take us through the rest of them and then also talk about the recommendations and conclusion and kind of the way forward. Uh, my section, each of our sections will probably be about 30 minutes and we're going to leave a further 30 minutes for questions. And as you may have seen in the typed instructions, please do type uh, questions through during our uh, sessions, through the presentations, and we'll try to answer them at the end of the session. So the background to all of this actually goes back a full 10 years when Rescura released a research paper called Spoilt Votes. Now, I did that at the same time of the launch of the CRISA code in South Africa. So the code for responsible investment in South Africa It was quite a momentous occasion. And this was a very exciting and kind of groundbreaking research. It also points to the fact that Rescura has been doing research into this area for a long period of time. It spoke about the then prevailing state of proxy voting in South Africa and 17 asset managers were interviewed. And I've just highlighted in italics some of the key findings or conclusion of that particular report. But as you can see by the parts that I've that are put in bold, we spoke about proxy voting being underdeveloped, policy documents typically weak, and that managers tend to treat proxy voting as a box ticking exercise. So the bottom line is we didn't assess that particularly well, not a great score overall for the industry, Although what we did find that the report had huge impact, Malcolm Fair, who's the CEO of Rescura and has been kind of driving this whole project, was contacted by many managers years later even to say, wow, that particular report that you put out really impacted. It highlighted the fact we weren't doing a great job and we did something about it. So now a full 10 years later, the burning question is, how has the industry evolved in the decades since then? And that leads us to moving the needle. How has the industry moved the needle in the past decade? Especially when you consider over this same decade, the number of corporate malfeasance that we've seen then. Steinoff, African Bank, Resilient, EOH, Tongot, and unfortunately we can name more. So that's 2011 and a decade later, 2021, we're showing the updated research that we've done now called Moving the Needle. And in fact, that particular report that we have put together is launched today. And if you go into the Riscura website under the research function, you'll be able to read that report. And I strongly suggest that you do. I think it's, it's great. And we're going to highlight some of those aspects today. And in fact, we intended to coincide this with the relaunch of what I call CRISA 2.0, the relaunch of, of the CRISA code, but that's been delayed to next year, but we've gone ahead with launching the work that we've done. When we talk about stewardship, it really incorporates two aspects, which is proxy voting, which is very much covered in sport votes of 10 years ago, but also engagement. So stewardship fits, fits under responsible investing, but we're going to talk to both of those key aspects. And here we have an opportunity to assess the progress that has been made in the current state of affairs. And we really do want to know, have South African asset managers actually moved the needle or are they just playing lip service to this? Is it just a question of ticking the boxes, which is what we found 10 years ago? And then we end with some suggestions on how we think the industry could move the needle even further. So why is stewardship even important? And we think it's critical. It's a critical aspect of an asset owner's responsibility. And we're going to talk a lot about the distinction between asset owner and asset manager. But that responsibility is often outsourced to an asset manager or other service provider. But this stewardship function enables shareholders to express their views. And that's really, really important stuff because you have that opportunity, but it does so much more. You can also use it to reduce risk, preserve long-term shareholder value, and enhance long-term returns. I would argue that's the holy grail. What more could you want? But there is more. You can also have a positive impact on society. And therefore, this is not only valuable, but really important and often underrated, under-understood, 
and under-resourced. And then asset managers as stewards, the asset managers play a key role, which is one of the reasons we've invited all our asset managers, many of whom, almost all of whom would have contributed to the server in some way because they have primary responsibility for stewardship as they manage the actual assets and are accountable to the primary owners and thus they have a primary duty to engage with those underlying corporates. And we're gonna discuss that relationship in some detail going forward. So just to give you a bit of a sense of the study that we put together now, why the scope than that in 2011? Because then we only dealt with proxy voting. We've included engagement now. We wrote and surveyed 82 local South African private equity managers or managers in the private sector space. Um, of them, 52 responded, which we were delighted with. We, we wanted to get very broad coverage. We thought that some managers might not be able to respond. And so it was actually ahead of our expectations in terms of the response. And importantly, every single large asset manager was included in that. The coverage represented almost 4 trillion Rand of assets under management. So the vast majority of the private sector part of the market. We asked well over 30 questions in this particular online survey that we put in. But in addition to that, we also held kind of one-on-one, -on -one, admittedly via Teams and others, interviews with 17 of the largest equity managers. It's interesting that 17 seems to be kind of a magic number because the same number of managers that were interviewed 10 years ago, and yet we, we, we sent surveys to 82, which is a much bigger universe. So it tells you one thing already, that the size of the asset management industry, the number of managers in the country has grown quite specifically. Now, there's quite a distinction between the survey that we sent with 30 questions and the interviews that we did with the larger managers, where we only asked three questions, and those were the following. How are you, your asset management firm, moving that stewardship needle? Secondly, how are you contributing to dealing with bad actors? And that could be either individuals or corporates, that could be in environmental, social governance, any of those aspects. And how do you rate what we call the plumbing of your proxy voting, which is actually a term quite widely used, which talks about kind of the process under which the proxy voting works. And so those were the three questions. We asked the managers to score themselves out of 10, where 10 out of 10 would have been kind of a perfect score, but it's very much an intuitive score. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. The managers then asked to provide support for their scores, give examples, and that was very rich. Those were very rich engagements. Out of that, we were able to um, put together this report that we're releasing 23 pages long, which ends up with six key findings, but 23 sub findings, of which the majority of that discussion really did come from the one-on-one -on -one interviews. So what do we hope to achieve in today's session? And, and this is pretty bold aspirations. Firstly, obviously present the findings from our research. We want to enhance understanding of the issues broadly, improve industri industry best practice and change behavior for the better. And if we succeed in that, our ultimate destination is to make South Africa more investable, Along with other key emerging markets, we wish to do this type of research outside the borders of South Africa as well. And so do watch the space in 2022 as we discuss some of that a bit further and overall to make the world a better place. Really in line with our Rescura Logan of investing with care. So some of the important concepts that came out of the discussions, there were three that I thought were just so big and so important that I, I, I pulled them out before we even go into the specific findings of the report itself. And the first one was this concept. You know, in the investment world, one talks about alpha and beta. Alpha relates to kind of a stock and beta would be kind of the market in, in, in generality or in totality. But this term was also applied to engagement and alpha engagement where you're talking about an individual company level engagement and beta, which is industry-wide. And that was a beautiful concept that we were introduced to and it's changed the way I think about markets quite a bit because there are similarities and differences between each. And I've tried to list some of those differences in, in the table below. I believe that both add value and both have to be utilized, but often who you have that engagement with differs. So on the alpha side is obviously with management or the board, but when it comes to beta, it's dealing with your peers, the industry, regulators, industry bodies, and others, and a very level, very important level engagement that I wasn't sensitive to before we had these discussions. Secondly, a very key theme that permeates the totality of our report and our findings is just how important it is to have clear clarity around fiduciary duties. And I try to draw a bit of a picture here to give you a bit of a sense of kind of this industry and where you see those two brackets are the two key fiduciary duties. On the left, 
is the one between beneficiaries and stakeholders and the board of trustees. So those are kind of the asset owner side and the far hand side is company and the board of directors. And you can see where they intersect is in the middle with his asset manager who has this two way engagement with his companies through proxy voting and engagement but also has separate discussions with executive management, often with the CEO of a company to talk about the prospects of the company. And so the asset manager finds themselves in a very complicated space where kind of there's no fiduciary duty, but there are contractual arrangements, certainly with the asset owner and that we wanna talk about a little bit more, plus these engagements with the company, both at management level, but also the board of directors and often the chairperson as well. So, because we have two sets of um, fiduciary duties, we really have two sets of stakeholders at the end of the day. The first point I want to make on the slide is the fact that I think there's a deep understanding that we don't know, we no longer only talk about maximizing shareholder returns and we forget about all the other stakeholders. I think that should hopefully be indelibly imprinted in the minds of all. On the right, clients, staff, suppliers, regulators, the community, society at large, large are all very important stakeholders within kind of the framework of, of, of what we have a look at. But if you're an asset owner, you also have your set of stakeholders and sometimes they're similar and sometimes they differ. The important message of the slide is it's absolutely critical for asset owners to be clear as to those expectations and to explain those expectations to the asset managers with whom they contract in terms of stewardship. So this is kind of a, how we'd sum up the implications of understanding the fiduciary duty better. Firstly, asset owners need to understand their stewardship responsibilities and to clearly mandate their asset managers or other service providers in that regard. They need to be quite specific often about the E and the S and the G. And then asset managers need to better understand and inquire and discuss and you know, engage with the asset owners in terms of those stewardship responsibilities and that mandate. And that needs to be done through a contractual relationship. And our understanding is that's not been done particularly well at present and therefore challenge to both asset owner and to asset manager to do better. Asset management, we feel, should preferably engage with the board of directors rather than with the company management on these ESG and related matters. Why? Because executive management are influenced by the contract of employment, they don't have a fiduciary duty. The incentivization structures are often short term. And so they have this desire to maximize short term profit. And in fact, they not just as desire, they, they incentivize to do so, which often muddies the water between kind of what their role is. And so that gets quite complicated. Whereas boards of directors are bound by their fiduciary duty to the companies and any factor, they have to consider any factor that may be material to the long-term sustainability of the company. An important understanding then came through that any shareholder, no matter their size, and often smaller asset managers are saying, we too small to influence this, are entitled to bring a matter to the board's attention, which invokes a fiduciary duty. And so every shareholder has that right and, and therefore the expectation. And so the board has to acknowledge the legitimate interests of all stakeholders, however small, and take any relevant matters into consideration. So I think understanding this fiduciary aspect is, is a really key part of our report and of the, the industry itself. The third key concept that came to me is we were cautioned often about the law of unintended consequences, and actually never more so than in the ESG and stewardship space, because there's so many examples. It is so complicated. When you talk about climate change, you do one thing, but the implications are not seen, but create something else. We divest from coal companies by giving them to kind of private equity or Chinese owners, but actually we lose total control over what they do and their disclosure and, and others. And there were so many examples given to us of how what you think is the right thing to do actually is the wrong thing to do. Directors pay, which often is excessive, or proposed legislation in terms of Remco having to stand down if there are one or two kind of votes against it means that you may not actually end up with a board of directors or enough independence there. And putting wage gap disclosure, which sounds like such a good idea in the context of, of society in South Africa, may not be a good idea either because management have an amazing ability to find the loopholes. And so one consequence could be less employment in the country as we shove off you know, cheaper labors elsewhere or outsource them, et cetera. And so I think it's incumbent on asset managers to engage very deeply with all of these very complicated issues. Typically, the simple response is the wrong one. 
and regulation and the regulatory environment, including the proposed changes to the Companies Act, can be very problematic, can often end up with a lot of unintended consequences because, as I said, management are expert at finding the loopholes and seek it out and actually makes it easier for them. And therefore, we need more debate, broader perspectives, often bringing in outside expertise, legal and other, to weigh in on the debate. So those are kind of some of my very broad concepts that certainly I felt I learned a lot from in terms of this discussion, but I think each of you need to kind of think a little bit about. These were the six key findings from our research, and I'll take you through each one, and we will cover some of the 23 sub-themes that sit underneath it. Obviously, we can't go through each, and I've, I've picked a few of my favorites to speak about. The starting point is good. From 10 years ago, we would argue that stewardship practices are indeed improving and have indeed improved in South Africa. So there's a tick. Secondly, systemic issues, very complicated, need to be tackled head on. We'll talk about that. In terms of the E and the S and the G, governance remains top of mind for managers. Number four, engagement practices have needed to evolve and have indeed evolved. Number five, proxy voting practices have improved. That's great as well. Another tick, but we do argue that collaboration can improve further. So I want to delve into those with kind of some examples. I thought a good place to start would be with the scores that the managers gave of themselves. And we certainly won't detail or name any particular manager, but this was just a summary of the outcomes of the scores. I've given you the, the average score, the median score, and interesting, the minimum and the maximum scores. Well, what, and uh, just to remind you again, the, the managers weren't prepared around the questions. It was very much an intuitive score. And often when you dealt with an asset manager, there might have been two or three people in the room. They themselves might have scored these, these aspects differently. Some spoke about, you know, is this delivery or intention? We didn't want to cloud the issue with any precision. This was just to try to get a bit of perspective in terms of how the industry saw themselves. What was quite clear is dealing with bad actors. Question number two was the weakest score by far, moving the needle set in the middle, and then the plumbing, the proxy voting plumbing actually came up with a pretty decent score with two managers actually scoring themselves 10 out of 10. And whilst generally we felt their managers overscored themselves, especially as we had more and more interviews, we thought we would probably have marked those scores down somewhat. When it came to, for example, the 10 out of 10, these are managers who have fully automated the process. Thank God, no more use of fax machines in those processes like we discovered in our report of 10 years ago. So we think those were probably fair scores. However, even in the plumbing space, when we spoke about the wider proxy voting system, the full value chain, so moving from the asset manager through the custodian to the final vote with the corporate, there were some concerns expressed as to whether that worked particularly well. And that would obviously be very concerning at an industry level or a beta engagement level. Secondly, whilst our managers score themselves very highly, it kind of already I've spoken about all these kind of malfeasance and corporate shenanigans that are going on, which kind of doesn't tie well with the fact that managers think we're doing a great job, and yet objectively or otherwise, it looks like we're not. So here's an example of that. The World Economic Forum annually puts out the Global Competitiveness Survey. It's a perception survey, but managers scores with perceptions, and so is this. And you can see for almost a decade, South Africa in these four key areas of corporate governance and related financial services scored in the top 10 globally, top 10 out of 170 odd countries in the world until about 2016. And then we fell off, off the charts. You know, it's been very, very concerning. And so there's a little bit of a disconnect. We, we caution the asset management industry not to be too happy with their scores. We would probably score them a bit lower. And we when look at something like this, which talks systemically to South Africa, and the perception of outsiders of South Africa, it says in financial services, we've actually weakened quite substantially. Secondly, systemic issues. So the regulatory environment was often cited as a hindrance, and, and we believe it is. In particular, the, co the concern around concert party action, which I, I'm going to cover in a bit more detail on the next slide, or shareholder-sponsored resolutions, any rules around disclosure of director's pay, because director's pay is such a sensitive topic, especially to the directors. And then ESG issues, which are not viewed by many corporates as a shareholder issue in terms of companies act and therefore whether or not you know, shareholders can bring that resolution to the fore was an interesting debate, which hopefully will be addressed in the redrafted companies act. You know, the comments that were made is sometimes these are used as delaying tactics by corporates who are past masters at 
divide and rule. It may be an excuse not to take action or collaborate. That's by the asset managers because we're worried about this particular area. And fixing these areas really requires that beta engagement, you know, a wider industry level discussion. But I want to talk specifically to acting in concert because we see that as an excuse not to act. You know, maybe some would say a reason not to act. But once we understand a little bit deeper, I think a, an excuse not to act. So principle C3 of the Creaser Code states, where appropriate, importantly, institutional investors should consider a collaborative approach, and yet acting in concert is perceived as a key barrier to collaboration. It's important to understand, however, that it only applies to change in control. So that's where managers will change a majority of the board or a major corporate transaction over 35% of the, the shareholding, which triggers something. We'd like to refer the industry to the Bowman's guidance note, which is commissioned by the PRI in February 2020, entitled Acting in Concert and Collaborative Shareholder Engagement in South Africa. It is attached to our report, so you can get a link to it. And we would highly suggest that everyone looks at that because it says, guys, you, you often are using this as a, an excuse, that as long as you aren't doing the two aspects above, you really should, in fact, be collaborating and, in fact, a lot more. And the second uh, item or the third item under systemic issues was the judicial system needs to improve itself by bringing white collar criminals to book. And, you know, just an interesting discussion, especially for someone like myself, who's not a lawyer, I'm an accountant for, for my sins, just understanding how, how long and complicated and expensive the process is and the fact that when it comes to criminal cases, so dealing with bad actors from a criminal perspective can only be brought by an authority, by the state, the National Prosecuting Authority, for example. Civil cases can and should be initiated by asset owners, and we do believe there are ways for asset managers to lean in, and we'll give some of examples of that, but that's an important element. We can strengthen the environment around it. Asset managers bring particular skills that could be very useful in dealing with bad actors. At the same time, civil cases are expensive to run, and the thorny question of who actually pays for it comes to the fore. In terms of three, and this is the last part that I will cover until before handing over to my colleague Chad, governance within ESG, the G, is still top of mind for managers. And so, for example, in our surveys, when we ask them, what are the most important governance issues? These were the four. Number one, board composition, and we would agree. Two, executive compensation, almost equally important, we do agree. Protection of minority shareholder rights and then bribery and corruption. Interesting that that now is number four on the list. On the right-hand side of the chart, how, what is the way to best ensure a successful engagement? Number one said face-to-face -face with the CEO, which I've already explained is kind of somewhat complicated because the CEO has you know, different incentives. In fact, the board is probably better, but that is number two, letters to the board of directors, 30 face-to-face -face with the board or the board subcommittee, and then finally a face-to-face -face with the chairman. It's fascinating that if you look at the bottom, a letter to the chairman came as zero. So we, we can't write to the chairman. You can write to the board, absolutely, but you certainly can engage and have face-to-face -face with the chairman. And that chairman role or chairperson role is increasingly important. So that was one of the themes that came out of the governance. A good chairperson and more than the chairperson, the head of Remco, the lead independent director, have a really important role to play and can make such a big difference. Uh, people often say it's just the, an old CEO, you know, those people have the skills to be a chairman. That's often not the case. There's a certain art and science behind chairing. And in fact, the chairman can add or destroy very significant value because they set the tone from the top. They provide, hopefully, ethical and effective leadership, ensure a well-functioning board. They can make a very big difference and therefore engagement with a chairperson are particularly important. The second key theme under this aspect is when we write ESG, which is normally written in capital letters, is we feel it should be small e, silent S, non-existent and big G, because that's what came through. Governance, the G still dominates. It does dominate everything except typically stops before dealing with bad actors. And as we explained, because of the legal and criminal aspects, they are probably a bit understandably. But what was fascinating to us is even S issues, for example, you know, inequality in the system or wage gaps between kind of top management and the rest were often seen in the context of the G rather than S, rather than as a societal issue. There was an increasing focus on the E, which is graduated from nothing to small E, 
And we understand that well because it's increasingly top of mind. It can no longer be avoided. We've got ESCOM, SASL, came up in every single discussion we had. We've just had COP26. It's impossible to avoid these issues. And disclosure will be really critical, what they call TCFD and others. But we felt there was far too little focus still on the S. In fact, it was silent. And we recognize it's a very complex area with many subtleties. You know, asset managers and corporates would say the same. There's a shortage of data. And in fact, a large part of the challenge in this space is, is dealing with government. But those dealings have to be done. Those are going to have to be held. Because South Africa has huge S issues and S issues, societal issues, which are simply not being dealt with. And so we see, for example, many businesses not investing in South Africa rather than engaging and having the tough discussions with governments and others. We feel strongly that we need to move beyond the excuses. It is indeed time to act. And we believe this is a huge opportunity to the asset managed in industry who is in need of this, uh, uh, the strong leadership. So it's an opportunity for leadership and a need for it indeed. And then incentive structures, shining a light on executive pay, always the most contested engagements as informed by our asset managers. And obviously so, because incentives drive behavior. And the corporate profit motive is particularly well developed with huge sums at stake. And hence it's the most contested engagement and it needs to be. So managers spoke about being a lot braver in their discussions and taking on management and well done to them. Engagement processes and approaches have indeed evolved over time. So for example, as the makeup of the REM package of a director has changed in different things, so the skills to deal with had to evolve as well. In fact, it's such an important area that we do believe an opportunity exists for a specialist focus just in that particular area. And once again, the chairman and the lead independent director, the head of Remco, play such important roles. There are proposed changes to the Companies Act that we think are very important too. The binding say and pay, I think, is a critical and important step in the right direction. Less sure about this kind of uh, disclosure around wage differentials, because again, the management of the, the asset manager have said to us, beware the law of unintended consequences. You don't want to end up with a situation where all we do is get rid of some of the lower level of, um, of employees in the firm, or we redirect and put special purpose vehicles in place that kind of has other unintended consequences. And finally, my last slide as well, in terms of some of the other findings, we're amazed and intrigued to hear that not only the, that managers will replace directors, sometimes it's even the whole boards. Now that can often be a lengthy process, but they mentioned that the rewards can be enormous. Massive upside to the shares if successful, even if it takes a long period of time. Managers also mentioned that they have two lists that they keep now a list of good actors and a list of bad actors. So, you know, when someone is proposed as a director of a company on the bad list, we, we say no to that bad actor. But when there's someone looking for, you know, a board appointee, we can look to the list of good actors. And the final point is that not enough is being done to deal with bad actors. As mentioned before, very complex issue, but we feel there does need to be some consequence. A signal does need to be sent to the industry to say these white collar crimes are no longer acceptable and there is a consequence to that. And so consideration around civil processes, for example, class action suits or looking director delinquency are options as well. That takes me into chat section, and I will return for the Q&A at the end. Good afternoon, all. Um, thank you for that, Glenn. Um, for some of you may know, my name is Chad Ward, and I head up the investment research team in South Africa for Rescuta. Following on from Glenn's topics, I'm going to move us into engagement and actually what's been happening in this space over the last decade or so. Um, if we look at, at what's going on in the industry, what we firstly notice is that actually a lot of engagement is preferred over divestment, which, which is an interesting topic and an interesting development that's taken place in the industry. Where we look at the results from our surveys, you can see in, in the order of escalation, asset managers would actually look to engage or use proxy voting as a form of engagement before looking to reduce exposures when they do face some form of ES or, or G issues. 
um, uh, prevalent with, within companies. And, and, and that, that's really something that, that's worth noting and, and, taking, and, and just taking a moment to pause and, and think about, because it does change a lot of aspects with the way we would think about investments, right? And, and maybe one of the reasons for this change is that actually, if you look at the, the number of listed companies on the JSE, so if we go back a couple of years, a good decade or two plus, um, you can actually see the amount of listed companies that we have on the, the JSE today is less than half of what we had a decade or two decades ago. And that could fundamentally change the way you, you answer the question of, do I engage or do I divest? And, and, and clearly from the respondents, it's, it's the, the answer here is let's engage with these teams to try and find solutions for whatever issues have been put forward on the table. Um, Shifting over to, to the, the conversation of divesting from coal. So this is very topical. It's something that's really impacted the global markets fairly significantly. So if you look at the chart over here, you can see a couple of coal stocks around the globe versus the relative local markets. And, and what you can see is that over the last five years or so, there's really been substantial declines in their valuations um, over the last, call it five years or so. And, and what you end up seeing, or, or the questions that you start asking yourself is, how much of that is related to this, this let's call it this ESG theme that, that's taking the, the world by storm at the moment? Um, that's a very difficult question to answer. And there is some research that looks at, at answering that specific question, but I, that, that's not really the question that, that really interests me the most. The, the question that interests me the most is, is that the right answer, right? So with, with all the, the naughtiness and, and the bad um, elements that comes with, with investing into coal companies, is divestment the real answer and is that practical? So let's just, just flip that question and look at it from a local perspective. So the graph in front of you is looking at the SWIX and the CAP SWIX, and it's, it's just doing a, a simple breakdown on, on a sector basis. And what you can see is, and if we use materials as a sector, as a, a, as a proxy for this, this um, resources type exposure, you can see it makes up a considerable, considerable amount of, of exposure to our, our local bus. So if, if we as investors take the approach, actually, I'm not gonna be invested in anything that's coal related or resource related, and let's start this investing. What impact does that have on our economy? What impact does that have on the, the S component of ESMG? Um, and, and we need to start asking these questions and being a little bit more realistic in terms of how we face these questions. If we look at a company like Sassel, the all investors in South Africa is really faced with the question of, okay, do I, I, I take the approach of engaging with Sassel around the, the ESG issues and, and trying to find solutions and, and, and putting in place answers that can eventually solve some of the problems. Remember, that's a long-term conversation. Um, or do I actually not invest in the stock, go benchmark um, um, agnostic and, and not have any exposure to, to Sassel? And under this, that actually, if the oil price shoots through the roof, that actually you don't find a, a meaningful way to participate that and introduce a, a component of what, what I would call alpha risk into your portfolio. And that's not an easy question to answer, right? And, and I, I think the part of the problem with this whole discussion or this whole um, question that all investors are faced with at the moment is that actually you, 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 you're breaking up the question into a now question. And, and, and actually, it's, there's two components to it. There's a short-term answer, and then there's a long-term answer or a long-term conversation. And, and I'm going to reference that throughout the next couple of slides is that we need to think short term and then we need to think long term and we need to differentiate between the answers that comes between the two. Right. Uh, so I'm going to unpack that in a, a lot more detail in the next um, couple of slides. But but if we continue with looking at Sassel, so Sassel actually forms part of this list of, of Climate Action 100 plus, um, which is basically a list of a bunch of companies across the globe that that's the worst emitters, um, greenhouse gas emitters in the world. Um, and, and what they've done is they've put some guidelines in place to try and change that, right? So actually, from a governance framework perspective, we need to have uh, uh, the boards clearly accountable in terms of oversight of climate change within their, their businesses. So again, there, and linking to the conversation that Glenn brought in, is, is that actually what's that role of the board and what, what, what duties from a fiduciary perspective do they play in the larger conversation, right? So, so that, that seems very important for me, and it's something that I need to emphasize there. But the ultimate the goal for this, this process is to reduce um, gas emissions over the long term, specifically 2050 trying to get net zero, right? Um, so that's a long term conversation. It's not something that gets solved overnight. But in the short term, we can put in processes, procedures, objectives to meet those long term goals. And that becomes very crucial in these conversations. 
um, start sticking with this short-term versus long-term type of discussion, we, if we look at the industry as a whole, what do we see? We see a, a big focus on the short term. If you look at incentivization structures, it's looking at earnings, it's looking at profits over a one year, two year basis. That's very much short term in the bigger scheme of things. And if we overlay the, the need for, for ESG um, processes and a lot of aspects related to it, these are longer term discussions that these things don't change overnight. So we need to have more individuals that are able to, to firstly be incentivized from both the short-term perspective because that's still important but we need to start introducing these longer-term in incentive schemes uh, within the corpus that we invest in because actually the alignment between your asset owners your asset managers and the corporates is not uh, appropriate at this stage because if, if, if you're sitting in a space and, and Glenn um, painted the picture quite nicely from a fiduciary perspective you have the asset owners on the one end you have the board on the other end and then the asset managers are sitting in the middle we need to make sure that actually the alignment between all three of these parties are, are, are well placed so that actually the asset managers become this medium that, that can help guide this entire process and actually keep everyone in check. Um, what, what we need to also make sure is that actually, and, and what, what I also need to emphasize here is that in, by introducing longer term um, performance objectives or sustainable performance outcomes, that doesn't mean you need to sacrifice short term performance, right? That, that should never be uh, something that pops up into this conversation because actually what you're doing today, unless you Cecil as an example, how many reforms have they put in place to try and, and change some of their, their processes, right? Is it enough? That's a longer conversation, but have they started? That, that's a, a different conversation and maybe one we all need to start looking at as well. Is more needed? Definitely, but it's starting in the short term and we need to see what actually happens in the longer term. And we need to just open our eyes to that a little bit more as well, right? When looking at in terms, broader in terms of engagement, a couple of interesting points have also came through our, our research. And, and the first one being actually we need expertise right? If, if your asset management team is going to go out and engage with company XYZ, we need individuals that are able to, to understand the bigger picture, right? So you, you, and maybe I can make it a little bit more practical for everyone is, is you can't go and hire an, an analyst that's been doing, I don't know, 10 years of, of uh, whatever research they're, they're covering and, and automatically flip them over from looking at financial statements to becoming an ESG analyst. That's not something that happens overnight. It can, in terms of you can eventually get to that space, but the thought process that goes into the E, the S and the G, it's, there's a lot of deep knowledge that doesn't come overnight. There's a lot of thought leadership that needs to be built up over years or months, um, if not longer. Um, and, and we need to recognize that because if we engage too narrowly, if we focus on very specific outcomes, we could miss something in the longer term that, that can have a significant effect on the company. And if I use an example over here, and, and this is a sugar company, it's, it's an actual live real example, but I won't mention names. So, so if you look at company A, which is a sugar company, they went through some kind of an engagement process um, and eventually putting in some processes that allowed them to, to start reducing their carbon emissions and, and introducing energy recycling, which eventually led to them producing uh, more profits. Again, in my mind, that's short term. Um, and and at, at some stage, they end up in the space. So, so where, where we are at that stage is whoever was engaging is in the space of actually, wow, we did a great job here. We're reducing carbon emissions. But now this company has got this pool of cash that they want to go invest and expand, right? That's the normal order of things. Eventually, they go out, they find a, a rainforest, um, chop down that rainforest and go and plant some more sugar cane so that they can expand their business. So on the one hand, we, we got the win on the one E and we lost a little bit on the other E. And, and like, what's the right answer there? So that's a very difficult question, right? How do you answer that question? So you need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture because these are not easy conversations to have. These are not simple conversations to have. And we all need to recognize that. And, and we need to be introducing the right level of expertise to deal with these conversations because this the ESG for me personally is not a joke. It's not something that can be taken lightly and we all need to recognize that and make sure that we bring in the right skill sets to the table when we have these engagements. Another key finding from, our, from our, uh, our research is actually the way you approach your engagements is very important. If you're too aggressive as an asset manager, um, in terms of how you engage, you could potentially close the door in terms of future engagements or future beneficial engagements that could come further down the line, right? 
Looking at the corporate management teams, another thing that becomes very interesting, and I think this is actually one of the key findings for us, is that, um, as, as Glenn mentioned, we, had, we ran the survey process and we also ran an in-person uh, or an, a, a, a virtual meeting uh, with, with uh, certain asset managers. Uh, and, and what we found is that over this three, four week period, when we were engaging with these asset managers, that actually a lot of the, the, the companies, so specific companies, let's call it company ABC, um, they raised certain ESG issues. Um, and they, they spoke about how they went to engage with the companies. And keep in mind, these are exactly the same issues being raised from each of these asset managers. And, and they went to these, these, these corporate management teams, investor relation teams, whatever the, the case may be, and, and they, got, they got faced with the same answer is, oh, oh wow, you're the first shareholder who raised this issue with us. And, and as we went through this, this three four to four week period of, of talking to these asset managers and consistently hearing the, the same feedback that, oh, wow, you're the first shareholders to raise this, the, the picture becomes very clear that actually the, the corporate management teams are, 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 are playing this, this strategy of divide and rule where they're just using it as a delaying tactic from, from getting to meaningful engagement, right? And, and, and that, that's really powerful. So, so if you think about it, um, and, and I'm jumping ahead in terms of some of the content, but if you think about it, um, if, if people are engaging more openly and, more, and on a more collaborative basis, would things like this happen, right? And we're gonna talk about that in a, in a couple of slides, right? The next, the, the next point that, that came out that quite strongly for us is that both managers and corporates they don't like engaging um, in, in a public forum, right? And from an asset management perspective, I mean, that makes a lot of sense because as soon as you issue public statements, depending on the nature of it, um, you do run the risk of, of potentially destroying some of the shareholder value that you're trying to protect, right? Um, and and there, there, that's that's working on a case by case basis. Now, there's also the aspect of trying to 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 nurture or protect a relationship with a management team that that you're trying to to keep in place for future and long term shareholder value. Um, so there's a there's a lot of different facets that you need to think about when looking at this. Um, but but what we do note is that while we don't see it happening in terms of picking up the newspaper and and seeing uh, exactly what's going on on a day to day basis. We do realize that a lot of asset managers are engaging, be, let's call it behind the scenes or behind closed doors, um, out of the, the, the light of the public, trying to move the needle as best as they can. Let's turn over to proxy voting and what's happening there. As Glenn mentioned, this is probably, um, it, in terms of proxy voting from a process perspective, asset managers that we serve as rated this uh, uh, the, the best as possible. I think he mentioned two asset managers rated them 10 out of 10 for this area. And, and I, I think to an extent that that's well-deserved, right? Um, if we think about it, if you look at a decade, 15 years ago, we were still sending faxes out to, to, to issue out our proxy voting um, and to a space now where it's a lot more systemized and or digitized. And, and the, the slide that you see in front of you over here, the, the, the graphic is really painting out the standard process for proxy voting that we'd see. And, and for me, this, the, this is a good achievement. I think the industry can be proud of, of positioning itself in this space, um, but there's still probably more that needs to be done, right? Can we say hand on our hearts that each and every aspect of this process is covered? There's no gaps, there's no points of leakage. Um, the proper controls are in place. Um, uh, I can't say that hand on heart having gone through every single line of this process, right? Um, but why can't that be audited? Why can't we get an independent party in to check those things, ensure that those processes are controlled and, in, and, and the plumbing is working like it should? Um, and that's something I'll talk about a little bit more as, as we head to end the, the closing of the, the presentation. Another key element that came out of our research in terms of proxy voting is, is the art of, of vote signaling. And that's really where asset managers and actually most asset managers would ensure that actually when they vote on some item, it's not a, 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 a place of actually I'm voting against management and that's it. And, and kind of leaving it at that. They ensure that they're going and taking the extra steps to, in, the, to, to inform the management teams of why they are voting against them. or what was the rationale behind the, their decision so that actually that pushes that engagement process forward. It, in, it informs the management teams of what the, the pain points are and, and, and potentially leads to future engagements that can change that, right? Um, if we look at proxy voting more generally, what we have found, though, is that a lot of the proxy voting processes are starting to become more rules-based, right? 
And again, um, Glenn spoke a little bit about unintended consequences, so, so have I, so I won't go into it again, but we just need to be careful that as we push towards this rules-based approach towards proxy voting, that we, we don't lose something um, um, that's very crucial in terms of the level of thought and the level of detail that needs to go into every single one of these votes that takes place, right? Um, what we also found is that actually most asset managers prefer to outsource to third parties the, the entire proxy voting process, so, and, and that's really more on the administrative side, so actually the execution of it. Um, what, what, what is interesting, though, is that wherever there is any contentious issues or votings that, that needs to take place, they ensure that the investment experts are closely aligned with us and following what's going on, and they make sure that what they're doing is, is really working and and. and and they're close to, to, to having their finger on the pulse, right? Um, what, what we need to still keep in mind there is that, is that the right approach, right? So when I look at this, my, my mind goes to, is this the most efficient way we can be doing this, right? And, and, and the conversation shouldn't be actually, asset manager A is doing this, asset manager B is doing this, and asset manager C is doing this, um, where actually the answer we're all trying to get to is the same answer, right? So we need to, to, to think and find ways to actually have asset manager A, B, C, and, and everyone else to work together and collaborate to, to, to make this entire process more efficient, right? I think key to all of us is that we need to make ensure that we're preserving the democratic process that the proxy voting um, processes are meant to do, right? To the final point on collaboration, um, I, I think starting off, uh, there has been a lot of improvements in terms of collaboration. So if we looked at uh, uh, what the industry has been through over the last couple of years, um, NASPERS a few months ago is case in point of actually seeing a lot of asset managers collaborating a lot more. So that, that's good. Is it enough? Probably not yet. Um, uh, um, Glenn spoke a little bit about the, the, the whole point about hiding behind the, the fear of, of acting in concert. I think that that's really something that's came up a lot in our engagements and it's something that we, we need to really take a step back as an industry and, and look at actually what are the implications of in the engagement processes we're trying to follow and, and linking that to acting in concert. From the research we've done, we've actually found that actually there's quite a big divide and, and in most cases you can collaborate with asset managers in order to move the needle forward. Um, it, 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 the, the other finding is that we also found is that a lot of asset managers that's relatively smaller than some other asset managers um, tend to find it more difficult to engage on each and every point that, that they get put on the table, right? And, and that's completely understandable. Um, as businesses grow, they're able to expand and, and get uh, more resources in. So, so those things solve themselves in time. Um, but, but does that mean that small asset managers should not participate? Does, is their shielding too small? Um, there, I, I probably would lean on the place of actually they should still engage. And, and perhaps the answer to that and the potential solution is we need more specialization and, and small asset managers can offer that. They can specialize in specific areas of ESG engagements so that actually you can, you, you can get these teams to work with, um, let's say the larger asset managers or other asset managers um, to actually help push whatever agenda is being put on the table. And, and actually circling back a few slides, that, that answer potentially ends up being more efficient for the industry as a whole, right? So uh, the, the, the conversation goes from you, 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 you to an us and, and that collaboration um, element that comes out of that becomes very powerful. And if, even if we circle back to the, the thought process around actually all these corporates are playing these divide and rule strategies as a delaying tactic, maybe those strategies start failing by implementing um, processes that are more collaborative. Right. Um, my final slide on, on this point is actually if we look at um, the preferred engagement processes of asset managers, almost all asset managers prefer using the in-house investment staff. I've spoken to this. I don't think that that's necessarily the most efficient may, way of moving the needle as a collective, um, but um, there are other asset managers that I've indicated. They're happy to use online platforms as a way to, to collaborate, and perhaps that's the, the easiest option to, to help improve um, collaboration between asset managers. With that, that brings us to a close in terms of the six key themes that we wanted to, that we've identified through our research. What I'd like to do now is just close off with a couple of our key thoughts and, and suggestions for how we can move the needle further. Um, in our report, we've highlighted nine key themes 
um, um, that we see can actually push the, the industry forward. And, and what we've done here is really placed them into three, three big buckets, right? It's the role of the asset owners, asset managers as the medium for chain, change, and then the industry as a whole. Right, and if we unpack each of these buckets, what we what do we see? Right, so our suggestions from an asset owner's perspective is that actually what we need to do is is be more clear in terms of the the this, our stewardship philosophy and how that should be executed. Right, so that's important. Um, I think when Glenn was talking a couple of slides back, he also emphasized that it's that it's vitally important for asset owners to be clear on what their expectations are. And, and by doing so, by putting these philosophies in place and how it would be executed, you get need to ensure that the asset managers that you engage with and that you invest with um, are, are, are mandated and explicitly legally mandated um, to follow those processes. And what that automatically does is you start demanding more, you start expecting more, and, and, and actually the asset managers um, who are all throughout research is sitting at different places in terms of this journey, um, um, you, you start doing more. Right. So I, I think the starting place starts to change significantly and we get to move forward towards making a, a more significant um, change in terms of stewardship in, in the country. If we look at asset managers, uh, I think Glenn spoke and I've also mentioned a couple of times now is that asset managers, the, the, the concepts that we brought forward about where fiduciary duties sit and, and how they sit in and, and the role asset managers can play as the median between those is quite crucial. And once we start understanding that, that conversation of, of actually asset manager A is trying to do this, asset manager B and C is trying to do this, that, that starts to fall away, right? And we start to collaborate more in terms of what we want to do to move the needle forward. And, and that leads on to the next point where it's really about how can we collaborate better, right? I think we all need to go back and step, um, step back and look at the, the, these um, fears around acting in concert, do our homework, make sure you, you, you feel comfortable about it, um, but that actually is not a limitation in terms of collaborating for the better of, of not only um, the asset owners, right? Um, in terms of the different pension funds. I mean, we all part of some pension fund and, and we all live in this country. Uh, we're moving the needle, not only for asset owners as a client, we're moving the needles for us and our families, right? And these are the things that needs to happen in, within our country. And if we, we follow that through, it's like there needs to be better processes from an asset management perspective to identify the, the bad actors and actually start weeding them out, right? Because how are we effectively going to move the needle if we don't start doing that? I know I'm posing, I'm, I'm posing comments or making comments that's not easily answered, but I mean, the, most things in life is not easy to answer. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it. So that we be effectively raising these points. Let's think about it. Let's come together as an industry and find ways to, to, to address it. With that, we do think that smaller asset managers needs to start specializing. They need to become expert, experts within niche areas because actually the answer of actually I'm, I'm too small, I can't participate is, is probably not the right answer. And it probably doesn't, it doesn't do well for how the industry needs to operate. We all have a role to play and we all need to be heard. Um, if we look at the industry as a whole, we spoke about proxy voting and the processes behind it, the improvements that we've seen over there. Um, but I think the main areas that needs to be addressed there is that we need to ensure that all of those processes, all the gaps are closed, there's no loopholes, the, all of those processes are being audited and, and, and actually we, we have full comfort that actually from point A to point B to point C, everything is covered and everything that needs to be covered is, is handled quite well. If um, uh, the, the, the last two points that we need to look at is um, us as an industry really needs to come together to find proper ways to, to bring white collar criminals um, to book, right? How can we play it all? Like all asset managers or a lot of asset managers already have these little books where actually they know that director XYZ is, is been naughty in this area already. And they've built up their libraries, they've built up the information and they've researched all of these individuals. Why can't that information be made available when there's XYZ case taking place? Why can't we as an industry participate in, in trying to weed out these bad actors? At the end of the day, I think the, the key message that we all need to walk away with is, is, is in terms of stewardship, in terms of ESNG, what we all need to do is, is step away from this mindset of actually, I'm this asset manager, this is my business, this is what I need to do, and, and actually just get rid of the I. This is all for all of us. This is for who um, each one of us are impacted by these decisions and, and by, by what the outcomes of these processes are. And, and actually it's about us. 
we are collective, we are an industry, and we all need to come together and find ways to work together um, to help move the needle forward. With that, I'm going to close off the presentation and, and, and open up the floor for questions. Chair, thank you so much for that. Um, I think we kept our time kind of perfectly. What I'm going to suggest we do is there have been a number of Q&A questions that have come through, which uh, some of them we've typed a very brief answer to, but I'm going to suggest we maybe discuss them. I thought there were some really good questions here. So I will make a start at any point in time that you want to um, just jump in, please feel free to do so. So the first question that was asked is, were the responses that we got from our asset managers audited and did those asset managers respond on, honestly? As I try to point out, it was a very much an intuitive score. There, were, there was certainly no audit of the scores. It was just the manager's own internal assessment and judgment. It was interesting, as I said, often in the same room, different asset managers might have scored things very differently and actually argued with themselves. So that was kind of an interesting outcome. So no, uh, I'd like to believe they responded honestly. Often, as I say, the debate took place within, certainly no, no audit thereof. And then the second question was asked, are asset managers appointing ESG focused special specialists or professionals or such, does that remain part of the portfolio managers, et cetera? Certainly as Chad pointed out, the vast majority, 45 of kind of the, 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 the responses said they do this engagement within. So it's using the investment team. I think Chad's asked some questions about whether that is or isn't optimal, but at least it isn't outsourced to kind of a, a, a tick box voting system whereby really important decisions are not considered. So in other words, they are considered now by the investment team, the experts, the people that are sensitive to sometimes very subtle, but very important kind of nuances in terms of what's going on. Uh, will a recording be available from this? The answer is yes, there will be, and that will be posted on our website. So that's easy. Um, a great question just about asking about capacitating new leaders, because often what we find is the industry just recycles. So the one director sits on many boards and one chairperson sits on many, the says your asset management boards, but I think kind of corporate boards at the end of the day. And that obviously is problematic. It's in many ways part of the problem that we haven't developed and we haven't capacitated enough in the industry. And the same people probably can't have enough time to do duty to sitting on five or 10 or 15 boards that they can't be right. And I think that's great opportunity to develop new leaders and the like. So Chad, I don't know if you want to take any of the other questions. If you want me to keep going, I just had a chance to look at some of the questions asked while you were speaking. Sure, I, I wasn't going through the questions, but let me. Um, okay, so uh, have a look now. at, and I'll just keep going. I mean, a great question asked as well by how common is it to link executive pay to ESG goals in South Africa currently? I think the question could be asked more broadly globally. My sense is not very much, but that is an important debate, and it's a debate that is underway. The problem with that, or the potential problem with that, is this unintended consequence. So you say to a to a, a corporate, you need to do A. And let me tell you, when you put a big incentive against that, A will happen. You just got to make sure that A is actually really what you intended and the consequences of B, C, D, and E are not kind of worse than the A achieved. And so it is complicated space, but in fairness, you know, asset managers are amongst the smartest people in the world. They are paid large sums of money. There's a, there's a knowledge is power and they have that power. And so they certainly should be able to and must engage in this area and start answering some of those questions. Chad, if yeah, you have a chance, do you want to? Sure, thanks, Glenn. I mean, there's one question here that asks um, if we could elaborate on uh, what do you mean when you say smaller asset managers should specialize and become experts in niche areas? Um, so I'll, I'll give my, my answer on that, Glenn, and then you can weigh in um, as you see fit. Um, 
so so I, I think maybe just to expand on that slightly, it could be so so let's break down some of the key. Um, let's just focus on proxy voting, right? Some of the key areas there that that you can go into is um, it's normally remuneration, as Glenn mentioned. That's quite a big area, um, and 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 you can go into a lot of different areas. That's quite big, right? Um, board composition, et cetera, et cetera, and and you can really become a specialist in terms of actually, if you look at remuneration, the studies that goes behind it, um, the thought leadership that goes behind it. Where this is actually not a very good example because the asset management industry in SA is quite good at this, um, but but that's just an example, right? You you can go and spend in enough time in specific niche areas that actually you know the ins and the outs of each one of those different pillars and you know how to, to navigate those areas quite well. And, and actually when everybody knows that I, when issue XYZ comes up, let's collaborate with this asset manager because they know that art well, they know their work there, they know that skill set quite well. So maybe I can just come in and just add a little bit to that. Kind of one of the comments from some of the larger managers is not an a desire not to work with smaller managers, but they don't want someone to kind of just leverage of everything they've done. The smaller manager must bring something to the table. And if that is brought, then there'd be a wide acceptance in doing so. So it's not just to, to kind of run off the, the hard work done by others. So yeah, agree with that one. Question was asked, is there a periodic performance evaluation by peers and higher level of asset managers and any accountability process? So all asset managers would know they absolutely are evaluated on an ongoing basis, whether by the likes of a rescuer or manager research teams at kind of large consulting firms, but certainly by trustees and performance is monitored very, very closely. And part of that is the problem. Part of the problem is quarterly reporting. And so when you say, how did you do on a quarterly basis? So in America, you mandated to give quarterly reports and lo and behold, you know, American management focus on quarterly reporting and quarterly results which means that that is short termism and you're not thinking about the longer term. So again, unintended consequence, human behavioral aspects are so critical because you kind of put something in place, but it can have a, a different consequence. Whether or not there's a sufficient evaluation of the ESG aspect, the answer is obviously no, not yet, but that is process underway and we would challenge the, the industry to do a bit more in that space. Definitely. Glenn, we have another question here um, from Vincent. Uh, can we reasonably expect managers to move the needle forward in ESG while these three important issues are clumped together? Um, um, is there a need to separate the focus? Example, environmental concerns require vastly different skill sets uh, versus governance in many cases. Um, I don't know if you want to answer that, if you want me to, to go first. You take that one, I'm reading the next two. <laughs> sure. Um, so, so Vincent, I think that that's a good question and that's the right question to ask, right? We, uh, I think what we're trying to do with the research that we found is not give all the answers, but it's starting to ask the right questions. And, and I think this is the right question. So we, we know all the issues that's out there. How do we start coming together as a collective to answer these? And, and I think your question is doing just that, is you've posed a very good question. Let's start figuring out those answers. If we look at the essay landscape, and I think it was in, in Glenn's um, um, content is the, the E is small, the S is silent and the G is big. That talks to your question right there. Asset managers in SA have been focusing on the G, less so on the E and barely anything on the S. Um, that needs to change. And how we uh, start changing that, I, I think, is the is the question that you're asking. And, and what's the most efficient ways of doing that? I think some of our suggestions talk to that, but I think it is a broader question. I think it is a, a longer discussion that needs to be, take, needs to be taken uh, between a, a collective of, of representatives, representatives and stakeholders in the industry. Thank you, Chad. Anonymous uh, question, what can you do to promote more collaboration, especially from larger managers? Well, I think the starting point is we're saying we need to collaborate more with the industry needs to collaborate more. But I think there were many examples given to us of that. So for example, a letter written by 36 managers started by one, but 35 of their colleagues joined in, I think directed at NASPERS. And that's a great example of collaboration because the issues raised were all the same. And so instead of everyone having a separate fight and possibly being told you're the only one raising that issue, in fact, we now have 36 managers and, and, and being quite effective in, in, in kind of doing that. I sense, we strongly sense a desire to collaborate, a need to collaborate, 
but that acting in concert was the one legal concern. And we're hoping that through reading that Bowman's paper and really kind of, you know, engaging with it and understanding it better, that managers can start to alleviate some of those concerns and in fact do more. So I think there is a desire. Now it's kind of getting around some of the stuff which I think is a little bit artificial. We call it an excuse. If we can move beyond the excuse, I think we will see more collaboration. And then David Courage has asked a question about, have we considered the current incentivization system and how it influences the asset management industry, including stewardship? And he asked the question, is there a better way? So we know who David is and David, we'd like to turn this around to you and say, help us because those are great questions. Absolutely, what is clear is behavior is driven by incentivization. Those incentive structures, if misaligned, lead to bad behavior. So they have to be better aligned, which is why I made the point that I actually believe that certain asset managers can locally and globally focus on this area. It's such an important area. If we get alignment um, of incentives with kind of better behavior, I think we lead to wonderful outcomes, which is a lot more long-term in its thinking, a lot more sustainable, a lot about this court, not about this quarterly's earnings, but kind of, you know, long-term shareholder value accretion, et cetera. So we don't have the answers to that, but I'm just so delighted that you and others like ourselves are starting to ask just the right questions. Chad. Uh, we have a question from Johan. Um, so, so he's making the point that asset consultants, multi-managers and other players are, are sometimes better positioned to coordinate any form of collaborative approach um, purely because they have the direct relationships between asset managers and asset owners. Um, and, and the question is basically, do you think they can play a bigger role in the coordination of collaboration? Um, Glenn, I think you, you're probably in a, in a good space to answer that question, having been on both sides of the fence. My problem is I was just reading the other one. Just give me one sec to catch up. Maybe I can just the one just before that. I see if I sent a question. The question is the following. Recently, a listed company did not open their virtual AGM, not an intentional slide to us as an institution investor on behalf of our clients. We complied with all the requirements. They apologized for this unintended oversight and indicated that the corporate sponsor indicated is not a breach of JSC rules, exclamation mark. So, I mean, when we spoke about that proxy voting system, and I think there was an important distinction we try to make between many managers or some managers scoring themselves 10 out of 10, absolutely the, the pro proxy voting process within an asset manager has improved in most cases. It was the highest score of the three questions that we asked. But when it came to the broader system, and here's an example, it used to be the fax machine that didn't work, and now you have an electronic problem where you're not allowed to vote, that's problematic. We were given some examples, not many in fairness, where managers said kind of we, we on this particular thing, we kind of knew the way the vote should have gone and it didn't go that way. It's knowing like the way that others would have voted, it surprised us. And, and that led to some concern. And one of the recommendations we make or suggestions to the industry is an audit of this process. I think that's kind of a low cost, really high value adding thing that we could do as an industry. Chad, I'm going to hand over and I'm going to read your hands question. I'll try to revert to that in a sec. Sure. Um, um, so so um, maybe just circling back to Jan's question and I'll, I'll give my perspective. I think that, I think that's spot on, Jan. Um, I, I think um, the, let's call it the intermediaries are in, in a good space to, to facilitate those engagements. And I think really what we'd be doing actually right now is in, in, to an extent is, is facilitating those engagements, right? Um, and, and what I do think we need to do is as a collective, we need to find a space where we can talk about these things, have all stakeholders present or separate, whatever it needs to be so that we can get it to work. And I think this is really us asking the question and then we, we really need to start moving the needle in terms of how we can start making this a reality. So maybe just to add that absolutely agree fully and we certainly see ourselves and others as having a role in this. But remember at the end of the day, we don't own the stocks. You know, it's got to, the people that, that understand the stocks, that own the stocks, the asset managers have that primary responsibility. But we in the background can certainly ask better questions. I think we need to work with our clients, the asset owners, to also mandate a lot better. And you know, th those discussions have already begun. So here, Malangelo, in the world that is increasingly or seemingly embracing ESG, good governance and transparency, do you think it is fair the way South Africa was punished 
by the world for disclosing the Omicron variant strain? Um, interesting question, not one directly dealt with in our report. Um, no, there are many aspects of it seem a little bit unfair in the sense that we've got good scientists to identify the strain. We didn't say it came from here, but this naming convention is difficult. If it's a China strain or South African strain, then all of a sudden you get identified with it. So probably not totally germane to this direct discussion, but my gut is a little bit unfair and many in Africa feel very hard done by, that's for sure. And the truth is this thing's going to spread. So I don't think they're achieving one hell of a lot by closing doors to us. Chair, um, do you want to take the next one? Sure, we have a question from Snowy and, and it's really about non-information usually refers to ESG information, such as anti-corruption, environmental protection, et cetera. Um, and how are asset consultants and intermediaries collaborating in promoting non-financial information disclosure from asset managers? Um, and then there's a clarification point that comes further, say, saying that I'm referring to non-financial information, promoting non-financial information. Um, so, so if I understand your question correctly, Snowy, it, it's really about, um, you, you're actually asking about how are we trying to collaborate to change um, that approach and, and, and actually promote the, that disclosure from asset managers. And I, I think that that's probably the wrong question, right? Uh, does it need to be asset, um, um, asset or, or let's just say intermediaries? Um, does it need to be intermediaries that pushes that? Should it not just be all asset managers? If everyone is looking for the same information, why can't you just push for that information as a collective? At some point you get heard and, and some form of change takes place. Uh, I think the wrong answer there is actually saying we can't get this information, therefore that's the status quo. Uh, I think that that's probably the worst outcome there and, and what we need to do is keep pushing, right? At the end of the day, these are companies that have their own guidelines, their own uh, processes. All we can do is ask and continue to ask. And, and then obviously there's the divestment approach, um, which as we've spoken about, isn't always the best outcome. But if we continue to engage, I'm confident that it would eventually lead to a space where we can influence meaningful change. Uh, Glenn, I don't know if you want to add anything there. No, oh, thank you for that. I, I, I've read the next two questions. So from Hamatso, is ESG still biased towards listed equities? Will we see more developments related to other asset classes like listed bonds, credit, et cetera, or is there not much being done or not much that can be done? So firstly, funny enough, my sense has always been that when people talk about impact and impact investments, almost always in the unlisted space, much more can be done in fixed income space than Listed equity space is the hardest space to do this. And in fact, the other question that I read has, has some kind of overlap with this one as well. So the truth of the matter is, as we said, and maybe let me read the other question, I'm gonna tie the two together. The investment universe in South Africa, South Africa is very small and incredibly constrained, <clears throat> pitting the hunt for alpha against ESG issues. And I think that's right. I mean, Chad, I think showed, may have showed the, you know, the number of shares that are still listed in the country. And, and that's why we can't divest unless you're a very small manager. But the truth is for most of us, we need to actually engage and, and, and stay invested, but engage stronger. In engagements with asset managers, there's no common policy at all as how to tackle this conundrum as the actual investment mandates do not include benchmarks that account for ESG. <clears throat> the solution would be an ESG adjusted benchmark, SWIX, C SWIX, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that is a very good point. And certainly there are some, I mean, I don't want to kind of promote any asset managers per se, but I can think of one asset manager who's launched a carbon, a lower carbon kind of benchmark, which in itself has a kind of alpha or outperformance component. If you believe that that leads to outperformance, so far it's done pretty well. So I think, you know, that is a good question. And all of these things, again, I think in this space, there's a lot of opportunity opportunity to focus on REM, opportunity to collaborate, opportunity to come up with new benchmarks, and many are actually doing that. So actually within the space, there's quite a bit happening already. Cool. 
we have a question from Kandai. Um, so from the survey, were there any trends regarding how advanced asset managers are between sectors? Uh, for example, equity managers versus fixed income versus listed property. Um, so so from, a, from a survey perspective and from the research that we've done, this focused on listed equity. So it didn't necessarily incorporate fixed income, but I, I guess maybe just to talk to that a little bit, uh, you, you need to look at the, the, the listing requirements and, and the rules around it and the information that gets provided around that. Generally speaking, the listed market tends to, to provide and disclose more information that sometimes you'd get in, in call it the, the, the fixed income world. Um, so then there is a little bit of a difference of information already at play because of that. Um, but I do think that's an interesting question and perhaps we can look to expand on that in future um, outputs that we, we bring to market. Uh, we also have another question from Mark. Um, uh, did you experience much by way of asset managers excluding any listed investments from their universe, any broad reasons? So I think, um, and, and Glenn might have touched on it briefly as well, is, is that there, there aren't a lot of asset managers purely because of the concentration in the market. So, so Glenn spoke to that a few questions ago, um, that that would all completely go out and be completely off benchmark and, 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 and necessarily disinvest completely from ESG. There tends to be specific reasons when that would take place, G being the, the focus area there. So um, Steinhoff is case in point where we, I can probably count on my hand how much asset managers held absolutely zero in Steinhoff uh, when that was taking place purely from a G perspective, right? Um, so there aren't a lot of asset managers that would do that. Should, is that something that should change? Um, I think that's a good question. We, we should probably look at that a little bit further. Glenn? I'd like to maybe, Chad, if I can come in on that one as well, because I think it's just really an important one. So <clears throat> first point to make is please don't treat our presentation as the report. The report has a lot more depth, lots of examples. We're touching on a lot of what is being asked now, which are great, great questions in the report. So my request would be, please do read the report. And I think there'll be more questions that come from it. We did, for example, specify where even large managers benchmark constraint will not invest in certain companies. If, if they got recalcitrant directorship and management won't change and they perceive there might be fraud and, and, and there were examples given, those might be few and far between, but nevertheless, absolutely, even for them, there'd be time would be taken out. And the second one is the subtlety always between kind of benchmark performance, which is seeking of return at all costs versus weighed against some of those ESG considerations. And that's why the mandate to managers is so important. If the mandate from the asset owner says, guys, we'll take a longer term view, and we're prepared to forego some of these returns because it's in bad actors or people damage the environment or don't care about society, et cetera, that mandate needs to be a lot more explicit and clear. And again, I think a rescuer can play quite a big role in, in that regard, but that needs to be, that's such an important discussion to be had between the asset owners and the asset managers, which I think will start to answer some of these questions down the line. Chad, I'm back to you. Cool, I see there's some very long questions coming through. Um, <laughs> so we're gonna try and get it. Though. I'll hand those over to you, Glenn. Um, but there, there's one question from Anonymous asking, how do we get to a standardized ESG reporting framework for asset managers so that clients are able to compare apples with apples? Who should drive this process? I think that's a very important question because how do you start evaluating something if you're not able to compare and, and understand that? It's kind of from a performance perspective. If you're comparing asset manager A versus B, how do you start? Um, how do you do that effectively? And and I and I do know that there are various options available in that space. Um, Glenn, I'm not sure you, you you seem to be moving around. So I take it you want to comment. So maybe I'll hand over to you and you can talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I think it is it is it is an important thing, and they say what you what you can't measure, you can't manage at the end of the day. I have one slight residual concern in this particular area. I would hate for all asset managers to look through a single frame or a single scoring system at a company and say, this is a one out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. That kind of goes against the report, I believe. It's about really understanding the issues a lot more deeply. Again, we gave the example in coal. So you dispose of your coal assets now Anglos or bulletins look a lot cleaner, but actually those coal assets haven't disappeared, but might be sitting in hands which are kind of worse off. So I wouldn't mind there being many kind of evaluators, scorers of companies in terms of the ESNG, but we do need to put a framework together. 
a lot of which, what we talk about, especially when it comes to beta engagement, is at industry level. So something like a CISA, we believe, would have a very strong role to play in much of this. And, and I think it's an engagement where hopefully you know, we, we will reach out to CISA as well. And we have invited some of their membership to join. And hopefully they will engage us down the line, because I think there is a lot that can be done at the beta type of level to improve standards across the board. Cool. We have a question from Delphine on the report specifically. We've already has... read page 21 of the report, which is impressive. It only went out yeah. an hour ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can, you can tell who we're talking to. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, so so um, just circling through the question is quite a mouthful, but effectively what it's saying is, is there's these big asset managers that are willing to come to the table and engage on, on some meaningful items. The question is really is who are these big managers that made this comment and what is something that is, is meaningful? Um, Glenn, I suspect you are a better place to answer that, but I'll, I'll give a, an, an, an answer from my side. So, so firstly, we obviously don't want to, uh, through this process and you know, the engaging with the asset managers, we indicated we won't be disclosing specific feedback points uh, so that we're obviously able to get the most fruitful type of engagement. So I can't specifically say who they are. Um, a list of all the asset managers that participated in the survey and the process is included in the report. So, so you can use that as a guide. Uh, it, it should be fairly intuitive. Um, in, in terms of something meaningful, um, I, I think that's that's potentially difficult to quantify. I mean, Delphine, you you played an, an instrumental role in the NASPERS initiative um, a couple of months ago. That's something meaningful. Um, so I, I think we just need to, it's a difficult question to answer as in years the line, but, but hopefully if we use that NASPERS reference and the impact it has on everyone's portfolios, as uh, that that is basically something that would be meaningful. That's a good answer. Brad Preston, great question here. <clears throat> Do you think there's value in including representatives of corporate management teams in this type of research and engagement? You've heard from asset managers about what corporate boards should be doing better and how they sometimes frustrate engagement. Wouldn't it also be useful to hear from the other side how we can optimize our engagement? So two responses. The first one, our, our focus is very much on the listed equity space. Questions have been asked about what about fixed income and unlisted, and those are good questions. I mean, there's a never ending list of <clears throat> places you can take this research, and we do want to take it to some emerging markets as well. But in this particular, I think it's a particularly good question. We did actually debate it. Now, there are a lot of corporates there, just a lot of listed South African corporates, let alone kind of unlisted, et cetera. And it was too wide. The remit and the scope would have been too big. But even speaking to, for example, the Riscura chairman who happens to sit on some other boards, he's made the same suggestion. So one, you know, I do think this research is going to go fairly broad. We hope it does. We put a, a lot of time and effort. We try to be a little bit contentious. We try to be a bit colorful in our 23 sub themes. So hopefully that will be understood and respected because I think it, it, it needed to capture some, some space and some juice and some energy and be a little bit contentious. But this is a very interesting one because you're quite right. I mean, I would imagine the asset managers must take some of this within the industry and then the alpha engagements back to the, you know, to the corporates. Um, but it's not an impossibility. I think that could be a very interesting engagement. And we think actually not just with the corporates, there's a whole lot of industry players, possibly let's think the Institute of Directors, uh, ASISA, um, Actuarial Society, SICA, IRBA, you know, independent uh, auditors, board. There's, <laughs> there's implications for everyone in the value chain. Some are smaller, some are bigger. So, you know, for now, big project, three months, and we put a lot of time and effort in. We wanted to get this up before December, which we just snuck in. Most of us want to go and leave now if Omicron will actually allow. But I think there's a lot of discussion. I think it's a wonderful point, and it's something we'll certainly debate further kind of early next year, but not December, hopefully. Cool. We have a question from Ben. Um, should asset managers not be enlisting more specialist knowledge to effectively execute their responsibilities on ESG? Um, so so the, the, it goes a little bit further, but effectively it, it's painting out an example where uh, companies would normally engage on, on REM policies or enumeration policies. Um, that gets voted on by the shareholders, but are asset managers appropriately um, uh, discharging their responsibilities given the, the specialist field of enumeration, how, do we nav how does one navigate this dilemma? 
I think that's a good question. And, and if that's a question that came out of this presentation, I think that's even better uh, because those are the type of questions we need to be asking um, and, and, and also testing, right? Um, and, and I think that that's part of the questions. Uh, I can't recall who asked the questions uh, a little bit ago, where it was also about actually uh, who, how do we navigate ESNG and should we have expertise? It was Vincent that asked the question, should we have expertise under each one of those buckets? Um, and then you remember under each one of those buckets there's sub buckets as well. So the less level of specialization or knowledge can go quite deep. And I, I think the answer to this again, and, and, and that probably I'm, I'm saying this a lot, but I think we all need to come together. We need to sit around a table and we need to talk about these issues and find the most efficient way. I think that's that's the key thing It needs to be efficient because once you get to efficiency and, and in efficiency doesn't mean outsourcing it to some rules-based process. Efficiency is actually having the right people with the right set of knowledge, applying themselves correctly to answer those questions. And I think that's really something that we as an industry need to start doing. Sure, there's so much I could add, but I'm just looking at some other questions and Saf, Saf said, have you considered what role the JSE has to contribute towards good governance with enlisted companies, specifically related to directorships and the capacity to fulfill their fiduciary duties? We have, we haven't had that engagement yet, something I answered a little bit earlier, but I think, you know, that's, yeah, there, there's so much beta engagement that can take place early days. For now, write the report, get some of those key things, and we look forward to this engagement. We welcome it. There's another question, which I thought was a great question too, which Mduduzi asked here. The report seems uncharitable towards company executive and boards. Boards and managements are possibly ceased, but I mean, impacted, I guess, with the same capacity issues affecting asset managers. What about the potential unintended consequences of burdening already stretched executive company boards with additional stewardship issues, important as they are, which come with cumbersome engagement process with multiple managers? I think it's a wonderful question as well. I don't know if we were uncharitable. You know, we, we have taken a certain position and, you know, we want to challenge that aspect of it. We, we're coming from a kind of a, a consultant slash um, asset manager perspective. Um, I think actually corporates probably have more capacity than most others. One of our sub findings, regulators are very short of capacity and could be kind of capacitated with kind of help. There are unintended consequences of all this burdensome stewardship, part of which is many companies choose to delist, et cetera. So finding that balance is an important one. I have one of my colleagues here pointing out that we're at kind of 4.30, the time that we were looking to end this particular discussion. I see some people have dropped off from my side and chat. I think we're happy to continue for a few minutes longer if you would like to. At the same time, you know, when I see that number drops a lot more, then we'll probably end it. So I think I think that is relevant. I spoke to a CEO of a listed company kind of two nights ago and made the same type of comment. This is impossible. It's over the top. That's why the earlier comment about have we taken this to the board and the corporates and whoever represents them could be a wonderful kind of feed, a follow up kind of discussion or thought. But again, hopefully asset managers will do that too. Cool. I see um, Delphine has, has clarified a question and I com got it completely wrong. So apologies <laughs> for that, Delphine. Um, and thanks for setting me straight. Um, uh, so, so really a question was around, um, what is that something meaningful that smaller managers need to bring to the table so that the big managers will engage with them? So, and, and, and uh, uh, that's a good question. Maybe that's something we need to clean up uh, as well, is that Actually, it's, it's, it's something meaningful there is actually, it's to avoid the process of, 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 of um, not everyone pulling their way through the process, right? And that has nothing, in my mind, that has nothing to do with asset management size. So whether you're big or small, shouldn't have play a role in the work that you're doing. The output and the quality of that work is exactly the same. And actually when you collaborate, everyone needs to bring something to the table um, and that something can be anything, right? It's a quite a broad statement, um, but that's all the, 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 that point was trying to make in the report is that everyone needs to come to the table. Everyone needs to bring something. So maybe to Chair, just kind of in, in summary, niche expertise bring something unique an example that malcolm used earlier in, in in presentation how about a list of good black female or other female directors that you could add to boards of directors there's a particular expertise desperate need for these expertise somebody can help but that's one of maybe a hundred different examples if one thinks about them long and hard i think we're going to end with the last question here by tassin 
Was there any support or discussion on affordable, better ratings companies who can make the effort to actively engage and deliver on ESG best practice rather than looking purely for the bad actors? A positive slant to find the long-term winners rather than look at divestments. I mean, it's, it is great. I mean, I was quite intrigued in kind of a lengthy discussion with managers while we only picked three questions, but it's interesting that you can spend an hour and a half and only cover three questions, admittedly, with a lot of depth and color and examples given around that. So we weren't trying to take a negative perspective, but bad actors, we felt, weren't being kind of dealt with by the system. We have now much a deeper understanding of why some of that is and what maybe can be done on that one. Um, and I think, yeah, better ratings companies, again, in the ESG space, wonderful opportunities. And we are seeing so many new companies coming to the fore and people seeing opportunities there. I mean, ESG is just the biggest thing in asset management space. And with it, I guess, a little bit of kind of some of the greenwashing that comes with it. And so attention to be foisted in the space and work to be done. But, that, but that's great. And I think we, Chad, would probably need to conclude um, I thank everyone for attending and for the questions and the engagement. We will try to have a look at all of the other ones here and see if we can work some responses too. Chad, anything further from your side? No, thank you to everyone for joining us today and, and hopefully everyone gets some time to go through the research as Delphine has. Um, so take the time, go through the report and hopefully we, we all get to meet somewhere where we're able to, to collaborate further. Thank you. Thank you all.